first lady. Here's uh, first lady that you see with She's working in pediatric cancer, which is a particularly interesting and complex area. There's a very nice paper that she will tell us today about the secondary cancers in children, so far as I understand it. So, how is the influence of the first tumor in the second tumor, the treatment of the first tumor in the second tumor, in terms of marks on the epigenomic level, but it's very much on the, on the area in which uh, we have uh, interesting contributions, which is in the general area of uh, child cancers, the origin, the evolution, the contribution of the therapies, of the previous therapies, and as I can just ask you with the it's complicated by because they don't have the long history. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot Alfonso for the introduction. So, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Monica Sanchez. I did uh, my postdoc on the, the Pesigas lab. Well, first, I have uh, prepared the first slide to, to introduce a bit on where I'm coming from, just for you to know what is my background. Um, so I have a background, a bit of bit on rare disease, on cancer, and also wet and dry lab. So I haven't been always like working on bioinformatics. Had a past on the on the wet lab. So first I was uh, work, uh, I, I did my first master in in Norway in, in Sweden uh, on a rare disease, and then I started working on the wet lab on functional studies on rare disease. Then I came back to Barcelona and I did my PhD with Violeta Serra at Bio on breast cancer, where I perform a lot of uh, translational research, a lot of in vivo work, so I work with mice, with cell lines, so on. Then I wanted to do a change after my PhD. I was intrigued about the world of genomics, of bioinformatics, and I did a second master on bioinformatics, and I joined uh, Nuria Lopez Viga's uh, group to study pediatric cancer uh, from the genomics perspective. So I, as you can see, I have this hybrid background that, uh, that is one of my main characteristics. So first to introduce you, what is pediatric cancer? Pediatric cancer is a rare disease. So I don't know how many of you work with cancer, but uh, uh, as the cancer is the incidence grows with age. So the, the more uh, we age, the more chances we have to develop cancer. However, when we go to the incidence on early ages, uh, the incidence is kind of low. So we can, could consider pediatric cancer as a rare disease, not, not that, that frequent as an adult cancer. However, when we check the relative incidence, so when we check where are the peaks of uh, highest incidence per tumor type, when we check some tumor types like neuroblastoma or abdominosarcoma in the pink wave, the diffuse midline -like glioma, that it's, it's the yellow uh, peak there, in the, has the peak incidence at six years old or so. Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, that they have their peak in the adolescence and young adulthood. These are bone sarcomas. And then the incidence goes down. So, and sometimes like you know, we see like osteosarcoma in older people, but most of these pediatric tumors, uh, they have uh, their peak of incidence during early years of life compared to other um, typical adult cancers like breast cancer, uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, lung adenocarcinoma or color rectal adenocarcinoma. So what is the possible explanation of this difference in the incidence rate of, uh, of, of pediatric cancer? So uh, there are many, many theories out there. So there's like a lot of uh, researchers and scientists. Uh, they <coughs> hypothesize that uh, pediatric cancer is a developmental disease, that while adult cancers, they are a consequence of mutation exposure, like all these mutations that we accumulate with time. And as we get old and we age, we accumulate these errors in our DNA, and then cells transform to malignancy with time. However, childhood cancer is more of a, 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 an error that occur in the DNA during the development. So it's more of a maturation block. So cells can differentiate. They get blocked in a certain moments of the development. And this is their source of oncogenicity, or this is what it's thought, that these alterations, these driver events occur during development. 
and this is the, 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 the what is thought to be the origin of pediatric cancer. And why is there pediatric cancer? So it's, uh, this is a disease, as I told you at the beginning, it's a rare disease. So not, there hasn't been a lot of uh, focus on research on this uh, disease because of the low incidence. And uh, mainly all the treatments are the typical regimens, chemotherapy regimens, uh, that uh, they, we, they were used in the 80s or the 90s. And they haven't changed that much. They still treat with the very hard treatments. And um, these treatments are um, very hard chemotherapies. They have long-term side effects. And, uh, and uh, this is very important in childhood uh, cancer because they're going to live many years. And if uh, they are already having a lot of secondary effects, a lot of long-term effects, it will affect their, their whole life. And um, there has been some attempts to bring some targeted therapy from adult cancers, but it's, uh, it's not always working um, because this targeted therapy, it's, it's coming from research from adult cancer. So I think maybe we need to research with the biology behind pediatric cancer to design beta therapies for, for pediatric cancer. So we need to understand pediatric cancer biology to develop effective therapies. And my approach here is to use genomics to uncover the, the origin and evolution of pediatric cancer, to understand where it comes from and, and why it develops, uh, to try to understand the, the biology and, and, and to try to find better treatments. So why pediatric cancer genomics? Why the genomes and not other omics out there? Um, so um, classically, pediatric cancer has been uh, characterized by having a very low mutational burden. So in this plot here in the middle, we see that uh, this is a logarithmic scale. It may have like up to 100 or 500 somatic mutations and maybe like, you know, 5,000 somatic mutations. In comparison with adult cancer, it can reach up to, uh, yeah, like, yeah, depending on the cancer type, like more than, than 20,000 somatic mutations. But uh, even though that they have this low mutational burden and they may have like very few drivers, um, I think, you know, that we can still get a lot of information from, from, from genomes. Uh, so I think somatic mutations give a bit more of information than what we think. So what I'm saying that, because as many approaches that have been, uh, you know, being the topic of, of pediatric cancer, like checking the or checking the... Uh, the, the p genome, for instance, uh, many of these techniques, it's more of a snapshot of the cells, like what's the state at that particular moment or what is going on in this moment. Um, and my approach here is more of, uh, uh, of on the taking the somatic mutations as these are cumulative with time. So um, we, we can see mutations that have happened a long time ago together with the most recent ones. And this means that we can do lineage tracing with, with somatic mutations. So this uh, mixture of all the new mutations, I, I really like this, this slide. This is actually a typical Nuria slide that she, she shows at, at her seminars uh, that really clearly shows this, uh, this metaphor of, uh, on Rome, on the city of Rome, where we have these like, uh, very old buildings and uh, very recent buildings in the same place. And if we are able to check the patterns, to check the differences between the different types of mutations, we can disentangle which mutations occurred before or which are occurred after. So this is an overview of what I'm going to present to you today. Um, so first, uh, this uh, work that we've been uh, performing in collaboration with San Juan de Deu, and Jaume Mora and Cindy Labarino on the origins of second malignancies. Then I'm going to show you some preliminary data on a project that I'm working right now in collaboration with Alexandra Pustinova. And then a, bit, a brief overview of, of my future ideas on what I think that could be interesting to, to go forward. So first, uh, the uh, Jauma Mora uh, came to our lab uh, looking for uh, someone to collaborate with to try to find an explanation to these extremely rare cases that he found there at San Juan de Deu why these, pa these patients, these children, uh, happen to develop two tumors. You know? How come this can be possible? How, I mean, it is rare to have one tumor. Imagine like a second one totally different from the first one. So um, we have few of these, um, of these type of uh, cases. I'm just going to show you here these three cases that I think are kind of representative of the, of the, of the overall explanation of, of second tumors. Yeah. 
Uh, so what could be the origin of the second neoplasm? Uh, for instance, we could find a situation that is just extremely bad luck. So they are independent tumors. So there are like two driver events during the development that in different tissues, they develop different tumors. Another possible explanation is that we have uh, this shared driver event. So there's a mutation occurring during development that maybe it's a mosaicism, it's shared between different tissues, and this may originate different, different tumors. And another explanation is that maybe the second is related to the treatment of the first, because these chemotherapies are very aggressive, and they actually, many of them cause mutations in the DNA, and maybe this is somewhat, somehow causing the emergence of, of second neoplasms. So what we did, uh, the approach that we follow, we performed whole genome sequencing uh, at high depth. We took uh, biopsies from the first tumor, second tumor, and blood. We did this somatic mutation calling. And uh, because we have the two tumors, we not only detect the somatic mutations of each tumor. So here in green, the somatic mutations unique for tumor one, the in red, the ones that are unique for, second, for the second tumor but also the shared mutations, so those that are in orange here represented. So these mutations that may, have, may tell us a bit on the history or what is the relationship between the two tumors. Do they have something in common or they're completely independent? And uh, another approach that we follow is this clonality analysis. Uh, so from bulk sequencing, from whole genome bulk sequencing, we can actually uh, differentiate which are the mutations that belong to the overall uh, uh, sample of, of, of the biopsy, so those that are clonal from those that are subclonal. So, for instance, in the left, uh, in red, is represented a mutation that is present in half of the reads uh, represented in a, in a certain genomic region. And uh, if this is an, uh, in half of the reads that we detect, this means that it will be in one of the alleles of the two chromosomes. So this is likely to be clonal and heterozygous. Um, the other way, I mean, if we find fewer reads than the, the half of it, this is likely to be a subclonal mutation. So, because most of the somatic mutations are heterozygous. Uh, so, yeah, so this is a heterozygous mutation and subclonal. So, first mutation will be in the parallel frequency distribution there at 0 0.5, so half of the whole depth. And the other mutation will be like lower, so in another population lower than, than 0 0.5. So um, how can we use this clonality as well as uh, to, to try to understand the origin of the second tumor? So here the approach is that um, if we take the, uh, as an example, like this uh, hypothesis A, where we have a cell that acquires uh, treatment mutations, for instance, um, then if the second tumor is uh, coming from a clonal expansion of that unique cell, this means that these treatment mutations will be shared among all the cells and they will be cloned. In, in the other way, if the tumor was already there at the time of the treatment, so we already have a clonal expansion, there are already few cells, each one of the cell, when the time of the treatment, will receive its own uh, mutation of treatment, uh, treatment mutations. And then when the tumor continues to grow with time until it's diagnosed, then these treatment mutations will be subclonal. So they will be just common in fewer parts of the, of the biopsy. And how can we detect treatment-related mutations? So what we do, we use the mutational signatures. I don't know if you are very familiar with mutational signatures. I'm just going to briefly explain. So mutational signatures are uh, patterns of mutations that are characteristic of, of certain exposures. So it has been seen, like the checking uh, type of substitutions, like C2Ts or uh, uh, T2Cs and so on. And depending on which context they have, so we have a mutation that is a C2T, but it, uh, in the 5' prime and 3' prime of the DNA, if there are uh, certain nucleotides, so in the certain context, triplet context. So what we do here, we count how many of these type of mutations do we have. We obtain this kind of plot counting, like the bars are just like uh, relative probabilities of having this, this, this mutation. And, and with this, we can somehow try to detect which are the patterns, the type of substitutions that are caused for certain exposures. We have, for instance, this BS1, that it's a signature, that it's a signal of, uh, it's a clock-like signature. 
uh, also age-related signature. And this has been found that cells actually acquire this type of mutation just by leading and, 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 and dividing and so on. So it's a, it's a typical uh, mutation mark uh, uh, just by cell intrinsic uh, causes. Um, we can also try to identify patterns from treatments like SBS31. This is the uh, uh, treatment from platinum or cis platinum based therapies. And uh, so we can identify that there, there's this type of substitutions in this type of context. And uh, with the mutational signatures, we can separate <coughs> which are the mutations that are caused with, with one of the um, mutational uh, signatures and, and the other. So we perform all of these analyses, the clonality and the mutational signatures. And with all this information, then we try to figure out where the second tumor comes from. So first case, uh, we have uh, this child that developed an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. This is a sarcoma from the, it's thought to arise from the muscle tissue. And uh, this uh, patient was treated, was cured, and three years and a half later developed an, uh, an acute Miller leukemia. So we did the somatic mutation analysis and we identified different types of drivers in both tumors. So we have the typical fusion on the rhabdomyosarcoma, Pax3, FOXO1, and then we have uh, typical alterations of leukemia, like a chromosome 7 monosomy, a KRAS driver mutation, and so on. So it looks like they're, they're, they don't have anything in common. They are kind of independent. Then I asked this question. So can we see treatment-related mutations in this, in, this, uh, in this second tumor? So uh, I, do, I perform this clonality analysis. I separate which are the clonal and which are the subclonal. And where I see the platinum mutations, I see it in the clonal fraction there of the treatment-related DNA. So what does it mean? This means that the uh, leukemia that happened, uh, the second leukemia that had this child, uh, it was developed, it was clonally expanded after the treatment. Just to have a little bit of an overview explanation is that there was a common ancestor, eventually at some point of the embryonal development, then there is these independent lineages, uh, then the child develops the rhabdomyosarcoma, the patient is treated and is cured from the first tumor, and all the cells of the body are exposed to, to platinum signatures, to platinum mutations. And then what we show here is that because we observe that platinum mutation is clonal, we can be sure that the clonal expansion of that cell that accumulated 932 mutations due to therapy happened after the treatment. And therefore, it is somehow related to the treatment. What do you know that you said in that line? Could that have mutations could also happen in the, in the, in the line that got it? Yeah, actually, that the platinum mutations uh, can occur in all, all the body. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. here, so here because the 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 first tumor, it's uh, so it's they are able to to treat the tumor, and it's uh, and it's uh, so actually this this sample from the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, this is a pre-treatment mm -hmm. sample. Mm -hmm. If it's a post-treatment sample, maybe we could observe subclonal mutation. But in this case, this is a negative control, let's say. That the rhabdomyosarcoma is pre-treatment. Uh, we separate the clonal and subclonal. There are no platinum mutations because there was no treatment. We just see the platinum mutations on the on the AML in the in the clonal uh, category. But in principle, uh, platinum is mutating all cells in the body. Okay, so second case, it's a child that developed an ependymoma. It's a type of brain tumor, and it was treated and cured. And nine years later, it developed a diffuse midline glioma. This is another type of brain tumor. Um, performing the somatic, mutation, uh, the somatic mutations analysis, we found that there were actually five mutations in common with both tumors. Uh, among these five mutations, there was this uh, histone, the H3K27M, it's a typical driver mutations for diffuse midline glioma, but what we found is it was already present in the ependymoma. So, therefore, this means that they have some origin in common, these two tumors. Then uh, we want to find if we can observe the platinum mutations in this case. 
And when we separate clonal and subclonal, in this case, in the diffuse midline glioma, we observe that the treatment-related mutations are in the subclonal part. So what does it mean here? This means that the tumor was already there present at the time of the treatment. And here again, I will give you this uh, explanation to, to, uh, uh, to, to summarize the, the case. So there is a common ancestral during development, and five mutations occur, one of them is the driver. Then they have these 100 mutations of independent lineage, uh, and then they clonally expand. But what we can be sure is that the, the treatment exposure of the first tumor, there was already an established main clone. Maybe it's not a tumor yet, but it's already a clone. There are few cells uh, already. And they are uh, exposed to platinum. And when this tumor continues to grow nine years later, then it's diagnosed and it's, uh, uh, and it's diagnosed as a diffuse melanglioma. The third case is a case of a child that had a neuroblastoma and uh, was as well treated with platinum and eight years later develops a malignant rhabdo tumor. It's a very rare uh, solid tumor for children and very aggressive. And in this case, we as well had um, uh, tissues from, from the autopsy. So we sequenced everything we had in this case and we uh, identified that the, the both tumors, they have their own driver events. They are of independent lineage and also with no relations to all of the other normal tissues that we, that we sequence as well. Then can we observe platinum mutations in this case and try to figure out a bit more on the origin of the second tumor? In this case, unfortunately, we, we don't detect platinum mutations either in the clonal or in the subclonal uh, setting of the, of the, of the, of the, of the mutations of the malignant rhabdoid tumor. So this, in this case, unfortunately, we cannot distinguish when the clonal expansion happened. So just to give you this overview, so in principle, these uh, two tumors have independent lineages, have their own driver events, they have nothing in common. We don't know when the clonal expansion happened of the second tumor, this mystery of this rhabdoid tumor not having platinum mutations, we, we don't understand why this is the case. Where was that cell when the, the, the patient was treated? That's, a, that's still a mystery. And then uh, we wanted to ask another question, given the chance that we had available a lot of tissues from, from, these, from these children. Um, we wanted to ask what is the impact of, of, of platinum uh, in the mutagenicity of the whole body of several normal tissues. And for this, uh, we have to go much deeper on the sequencing. So whole genome is not enough to detect uh, the platinum mutations in normal tissues because normal tissues are not clonal expansions. We have maybe like uh, one or, or two cells like harboring these platinum mutations. We have to go much deeper and do duplex sequencing. This duplex sequencing is an error corrected ultra deep sequencing. So it's a way of, it's a, a, a bulk sequencing that uh, we can differentiate those real mutations in single molecules compared to the sequencing artifacts. And thanks to this technology, we are able to sequence these uh, uh, some tissues from patients. Uh, for instance, in case two, we do duplex sequencing in blood samples. And there, uh, there we see that there are like a lot of treatment related mutations on blood, uh, 269 compared to 25 that we calculate estimated are per genome. And when we put that uh, on a mutation rate scale. So how many mutations per day are the ch children acquired? So we see that uh, there's like a much higher mutation rate of, of the treatment rather than the normal aging processes. And this is, we see the same for the, the other case where we had a lot of uh, uh, um, tissue from the autopsy in the liver, in the pancreas, bone marrow, lung, all normal tissues analyzed all of them harbor a um, mutational signature of uh, platinum and the mutational rate is much higher, more than 100 times higher than the normal aging processes. So a bit on conclusions on this first part is that we identify these three uh, examples uh, represent representing uh, three different uh, kinds of origin of second tumors in children. And as well uh, uh, with the duplex sequencing and the sequencing of normal tissues, 
we are able to detect that the mutation load that is leaving chem the chemotherapy in tissues is very high and likely potentially giving uh, long-term side effects. And this uh, uh, work was published in Cancer Discovery this last March, and we were actually very happy that a lot of media uh, covered the, 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 pro the, the, the results and the publication. And uh, yeah, we were very happy that uh, there was a lot of interest on, on our results. Now I'm going to show you a little bit what I have been doing this last month, last year, uh, on the collaboration with Alexandra Gustinova. She's a PI both at IRB and San Juan de Deu and uh, she's working with uh, with rhabdoid tumors. So rhabdoid tumors uh, are a type of uh, uh, pediatric cancer that are very aggressive. Uh, there is no much treatment available. They are characterized by just like this uh, single driver event that it's the deletion of SMARC-B1, or in some, some cases SMARC-A4, but mostly SMARC-B1. And uh, with Alexandra, we were able to, uh, to collect a lot of uh, biopsies, a lot of cases from San Juan de Deu that have been collected for, for so many years. We were able to whole genome sequence 27 uh, samples from San Juan de Deu, plus I was able to download from, from repositories up to 56 whole genomes. And the aims on this project is just to study the origin of this rabbit tumor, where they come from, how, is the, how they are developed and to study the clonal evolution across primaries, metastases, and, and so on. So uh, I have uh, analyzed this cohort that it's, uh, I think, uh, the, the largest cohort of this type of tumor up to date, 83 samples. I have done this signature analysis. I already have seen that some of them have uh, uh, treatment exposure. So they're like uh, mut uh, platinum mutations accumulated there in the, in the red bars. And just to give you a bit of an example, this is preliminary data, so I am still working on that. Uh, but uh, this is a very interesting case where we have two samples from this patient. So we have the primary tumor, and then we have also sequenced uh, metastasis in the lung, and uh, like two years later. And what we see here, also we do this mutational signature analysis, separating clonal and subclonal. We see that the metastasis lesion has expanded after the treatment because we observe cisplatin treatment uh, mutational signatures in the in the clonal fraction of the of the metastasis. So I have shown you already how to allocate uh, how to approximate what is the origin of the of the tumor with the platinum signatures. So I explained to you that if we have the clonal mutations or subclonal platinum mutations. We, we can identify if it was before or after the treatment. But what happens when we want to know what is the origin of a tumor before the treatment? So the first tumor, how we can do that? We can actually follow the approach of the aging signatures. The aging mutations are these mutations that accumulate at a constant rate through, through life. So we can actually, by measuring the number of mutations related to aging processes, we can actually make a, a, an approximation of the of the that cell, how old or how uh, how uh, how recent it is the clonal expansion, or how far in time it's the clonal expansion. So we have followed this approach of the aging mutations for the whole rhabdoid cohort. So this is a plot representing the number of mutations related to aging processes in the y-axis, and the x-axis is the age of diagnosis. And we already see that the, there is this correlation of the, with the age of the patient with the number of mutations. And this is what it means. This means that the, that the clonal expansion can happen at different uh, times during, the, during, the, during the, uh, the childhood of the patient. So you, and if we mm, go a, a bit deeper and we check this, this, uh, this cloud of, of points earlier in life, uh, even with the, just, just this few uh, low tumor mutational burden, we are able to see this tendency, this regression of uh, having earlier clonal expansions and later clonal expansions. So it's not always happening very early in life. It can happen very late, very late in life. Another methodology that we can use to try to time uh, in pediatric cancer is to use the variable allele frequency distribution 
uh, within the to time the copy number gains. So, for instance, if we have these two chromosomes, the given chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes, one of the copies gets duplicated. So, the mutations in red that happen in that copy will also be duplicated. But then when uh, the time passes after these duplications, other mutations may accumulate in each one of the copies, but this will be uh, different in both copies. So by checking the distribution of the viral allele frequency, we can differentiate those mutations that happened before the duplication and those that happened after the duplication. But how can we time chromosome loss? That's, uh, that's that, that is useful for duplications when the driver is about duplication or amplification, but what about losing the copy of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the gene? And this is the case for, 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 uh, for raptoid tumors. Actually, when I was like uh, uh, studying this cohort and I was checking, I was going in deep what was going on, and I found a lot of times that there was this single event of copy neutral loss of the trisoiosity in many of them. And like up to 40% of the cohort, they have this event. What is this copy neutral loss of the acidosity? So given the case of these two chromosomes, one of them have the smart B1 mutations, let's say, uh, but we need both copies to be mutated to, to have the rhabdoid tumor. So imagine that there is mitotic recombination ongoing, and there is this exchange of chromatin information between homologous uh, chromosomes. Then we have the chromatin segregation, and one of the cells will be normal, and the other cell will have both mutations of the of the copy of the smart B1. And because we have all of this copied uh, region, we can actually use this to time when the loss of the second allele happened. And actually, here I'm showing this is very preliminary data. Um, um, I show you two cases of the whole cohort where we have this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. We have uh, this uh, region in gray, highlighted in gray, where the black line, it's, uh, it, it's showing that we have two copies of one of the homologous uh, chromosomes, zero copies of the other. So just by comparing how many mutations I have on homozygosity in the blue uh, shadow below, and uh, compared to the ones that are heterozygous in the yellow shadow, we can estimate when this duplication or this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity happen. So if we have a lot of, see, all the mutations that are in, do, in the two copies are the mutations that were before this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. And the mutations that are in single copies are the mutations that happened after. And what do we see here is that in the patient six, we only see one single dot in the mosaicus uh, region. This means that this is the one that happened before. And actually, this is the friendship mutation of the smart b one and, and, and as you can see below, we have many more mutations that happened after the, the duplication. So this means that this event is very, very early in life. And the, 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 then the cell keeps on accumulating mutations until maybe later in life uh, will clonally expand. This is, I represented here. So imagine that we have, you know, this zygote, this initial cell that uh, has this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity that happens very early in life, but this cell, it's not yet clonally expanding. So it will keep on accumulating aging mutations until later in life, up to 15 years, uh, that we have some patients diagnosed at 15 years, that uh, then this cell clonally expands. So now I will show you a little bit um, what is my future work, what, I, what are my plans after, after this uh, project. So I want to expand this uh, type of studies into other tumor types. Uh, we have plenty of data in repositories in targets and Jude, kids first. There are like a lot of whole genomes there. It's ready there. We don't have to, uh, uh, yeah. So we can actually use this, this data to, to start uh, studying uh, other tumor types. And uh, which other tumor types? For instance, and, uh, there is these uh, cases of rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and wing sarcoma. They are characterized by this fusion. You don't know how these fusions sometimes occur. Maybe there are like other um, rearrangements that we can use, like copy neutral loss of heterozygosity to time when these translocations may occur. And then uh, we can also compare what is the difference. This osteosarcoma that happens in, in adolescents. Uh, what is the difference? We don't know what that happened in in older people, if there is any difference. 
So with this, I want to characterize of this tumor evolution, when are the driver events occurring, which is the order of the driver events if there is more than one. So all of this is the study that I want to, I want to approach here. And of course, because I was in the, in the lab of Nuria Lopez Vigas, I was doing these last four years coordinating Intogen. Uh, I think this is a super powerful tool to identify drivers of cancer. And uh, with all these in-depth analysis of uh, newer tumor types, rarer tumor types of children, we can keep on fine tuning which are the drivers of, of, of pediatric cancer. So just to summarize, here that uh, we can say the pediatric cancer genomes are very informative, although they have low mutational burden. Uh, we can use mutational signatures. Uh, we, have their, we have used our creativity to, to use these two ways of, of using mutational signatures, either with the treatment-related mutations or aging mutations. We can also use variable allele frequency distribution to time copy number gains and copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, as I've shown you. And the uh, data is already available in many repositories, is, we just have to use it. And last, uh, yeah, this is my group where I've been these last four years. Uh, I, like a big thank to Abel and Nuria for the great uh, discussions, conversations, and the collaborators, Alexandra, Jaume, and Cynthia. I've learned a lot on pediatric tumors and, 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 and computational capacities so to, to do research. And yeah, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm curious uh, if secondary malignancies are more common in children versus adults, or how you think that this work could possibly apply to, like, or at least this aspect of the work could apply to like adult cancers as well. Yes, actually, it's uh, secondary leukemia are quite common in adult cancer, and I would say more common than in, on children. So it's actually rare that the child develops a second leukemia. It happens, but it's rare. Actually, it's, the incidence is higher on, on adult cancer. So breast cancer uh, uh, treated patients, they, they have higher risk of developing sec second leukemias. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very, very, very nice. Thanks. Um, what is a curiosity? So. You are centered on somatic. Yes. But uh, it could be the novel mutation development. I don't know whether the novel mutations are considered somatic or not, but could, you, you have not touched germline. I, I have I have checked germline, um, but it's difficult to interpret it as, you know, there are like many SNPs variants that could affect and uh, there were no clear signs on the germline on the patients that I have analyzed that could give, you know, higher risk. I always see the somatic driver event uh, happening. Uh, I don't know if there is any, could be any germline variant that could increase the risk of mutagenicity during development. And uh, there's still a lot to do in the germline, but yeah, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult to work with, with uh, germline. In somatic mutations, we talk about 500, 1,000, 5,000. The germline's like 1 million variants. I mean, what? It's... But, but the, the germline that you check, you started from genotyping or from whole genome? From whole genome. Also, you could check whether they were rare mutations. Yeah, exactly. So I, I did a study uh, checking all the germline, uh, which are the uh, SNPs in common uh, hereditary cancer genes, some um, predisposing genes, and now I've checked like what could be, but sometimes for, if I see like one SNP in, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah, one, one, one gene that came in D2A, for instance, but it's one of the copies and it's a very long gene. I mean, what, what can I say with this? I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I know that the, there's like still a lot of thing, a lot of work to do on the germline. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did an in-depth analysis in this case, especially, I mean, the second tumors, I mean, because of this rarity, that was one of the approaches, but we couldn't find any clear signal there. And there were like few SNPs in few uh, uh, cancer driver genes, but it, it was, could be any SNP, I mean, could be population. I mean, yeah. If I may, a second one. Yes. When uh, the second or the first example or the second example that you showed, yeah. that there was a second tumor, TML, came from uh, ARMS. Yes, remote. the case one, yeah. Those 900 that are accumulated to the 
European. Yeah. Uh, will it generate new drivers? Or the drivers are the new ones, the same ones? That's, the that's a very good question because this is one of the, we still don't know. Well, actually, in the in the paper in uh, in, uh, in the supplemental, we did uh, that was one of the questions from our reviewer to calculate the probability, the chance that uh, some of the driver events in the leukemia are caused by the chemotherapy, and the probability that we got was kind of low. So it was likely that the mutation is caused most likely by aging processes rather than the platinum processes. So there are like several theories here. So maybe, I mean, platinum is mutagenic, it mutates the genome, and it can cause driver events, and then uh, generating the, the second tumor. But uh, the other uh, explanation is that mutations are already there. They are there, and there's like blood cells that they have driver events, but it's not cancer yet. But the treatment makes like a bottleneck and makes this environment change that pushes the clonal expansion of the cell. And this is, yeah, there are like these two hypotheses and uh, we still don't know, um, but it, it looks like it could be like, uh, like more of the second explanation on this, like the mutations are there, um, but we don't have cancer yet, but maybe we need some sort of uh, environmental change to, to push the clonal expansion and develop cancer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I had a question about structural variants. Do you think it's possible to do this subclonal analysis with, um, with structural variants and things like rearrangement, any kind of rearrangement? I don't know if you've tried this. Or yeah, this. actually, um, yeah, I mean, the more complex is a genome, more difficult it is to disentangle all of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the approaches that I want to follow is like, uh, how much can I guess or how much can I um, calculate from very complex genomes? So osteosarcomas, for instance, are very complex. Uh, so I don't know how clean it is the data in order to, to try to decipher the, the time of events. Um, when we have like a whole chromosome duplication, that it's easier in the, all of this is clonal. When we have subclonal rearrangements, the data is a bit more complicated. It, I mean, potentially we could, we can, depends on the, yeah, how many rearrangements we have, if it's super complex and the, and the quality of the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering in which context is this mitotic recombination leading to the copy um, neutral locomotor heterozygote that is happening? Um, so, actually, this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity, uh, there, there may be other biological explanations for that. So, it's still like a lot of. Um, so, uh, mitotic recombination is one of the clearest. So, it has been shown already that it, it's actually causing in, in, in many. I don't know if this is something that it's more common during development. This is still to be shown. Um, yeah, I mean, there are like several processes that can cause this copy neutral loss. And uh, one of them is the method of recombination. And whether this could be more frequent in development, we still have to know. But is it related to homology recombination repair or something like that? Or, or how is this happening? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't fully, I'm not an expert on this type of uh, uh, rearrangement and so on, but could be. I mean, there's like a molecular recombination uh, mechanism can also lead to uh, the copy of the, of the allele that it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. Have you included the sex dimension in you know, the, all, all the analysis that you have done? There's more difference between uh, in, in boys or girls, or have you seen if the immune mutation affects more to the boys or the girls or all these kind of things? I, I mean, yeah, we have checked. Actually, we have uh, on the three cases, uh, yeah, we have one boy and, and two girls, and we don't see a difference. I mean, there are like, these are very few numbers. Uh, yeah, they tell that you have 83 or something like that. Ah, yeah, that's on the rhabdoids. Yeah, in the rhabdoid cohort, we have uh, yeah, more or less the same number on boys and girls. So rhabdoid, I don't know if it's slightly higher on boys, but uh, but, I, but I think there, there is no, clinically, there are no like, um, uh, 
yeah, like clear like higher incidence on, on either or both sexes. So it's, yeah, I don't I don't think there is something sex related on the rhabdoid tumors, but that's something that we could explore. I mean, we still have a lot to do on the rhabdoid cohort. Uh, you want to check like all the information that we have. Maybe checking the the sex uh, that could be interesting. Maybe on the type of rearrangements, it's different. Following this 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 line, so I'm mean, just playing while you are doing this to trace the history of the tumors mm -hmm. and why the you get the images of the or the special data with these uh, pictures of the status. But uh, from the clinical point of view, obviously you want to link the two things. No? You want to link the study of the history with the rest of the information to see what is the next treatment or how to treat this. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean. This is like a very first step. Like, so my argument here is that we have to understand where they're coming from. Well, I mean, uh, to understand the biology, where are they coming from? Is it really embryonal? In, in which stage of the embryo, embryonal de development? You know? Um, yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, if we understand, for instance, if this cell that carbos the driver event, it's occurring, but it's not yet a tumor. If we understand that this is like that, that this is happening, and maybe driver mutations are more common, but not everyone is developing uh, cancer, that is very important to know because maybe we could start thinking on prophylactic or maybe prevention. I mean, this could pave the way towards something like that, like in a so if we understand how um, pediatric cancer originates. Maybe the driver mutation is not enough. Maybe something else that we need. Maybe something that happens during adolescence that it's this growth hormones. Maybe this could, you know, pave the way to 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 do something in the uh, in this. In this I guess uh, I was I was trying to understand more if there is a, a link between these parts. So you follow the drivers and you yeah. uh, relate with the previous treatment and then you see how this progression with the actual uh, phenotypic consequences. There's a tumor and it's different from the other tumors or it's different from the normal or can you use the rest of the information to understand the consequences of the of the mutations. And the consequences you have a tumor but not all yeah. the tumors are either the same and they are not equally for, for, for yeah there's heterogeneity also yeah, I mean, we can characterize the, the evolution of a tumor. I mean, the, on part of the rhabdoid cohort, uh, I've shown you in the example that we have this metastasis. Mm -hmm. So to understand how this metastasis occurs, if it's mm -hmm. after the treatment, if this treatment could have made acquiring some, some resistant mutations. So with all of these genomic data, we can do a lot of studies and try to understand the evolution, why, why uh, tumors do not respond to the chemotherapy or also, it's very interesting that we are also doing this in collaboration with Sachin and Nadeu, and one of the master students now in, in Nuria's lab. Uh, there is this patient that extremely, I mean, it's an extraordinary responder to immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, this is an XPC mutant, germline mutant. It has like huge mutational burden. It's very, very high. This patient developed a melanoma, then was treated with immunotherapy, was cured, and then developed a sarcoma of the bone. Mm -hmm. and and it was cured and is alive, this patient. So we don't know why we we are now in the process of understanding why this patient has responded, if there is any, uh, yeah, like uh, now these like uh, chromosomal rearrangements, if there is like all of this like high mutational burden, this is what is with this causing this extraordinary response. So with, uh, with genomic data, we can explore also, yeah, why patients respond so well as well. And we can extrapolate that maybe to benefit other patients with the same characteristics. Well, a curiosity: uh, How much is known about the cis-platinum uh, tolerance or resistance at the genomic level? Are the people with uh, some genomic composition more susceptible to cis-platinum treatment, or they have too much? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, I think it's not it's not known yet if there is any um, depending on the. Yeah, like germline variants that mm -hmm. we may have, or so on. If there's like more repair going on to yeah. avoid mutations, mm -hmm. that could be something. Yeah, I I don't think there's anything known yet in this regard, but that could be very interesting to talk about. How is the 
So out of curiosity, to what is how is the treatment adjusted to the children for this particular treatment, standard treatment? Uh, how do you adjust this by children, by weight, by age? By uh, that's that's by a thing? yeah, that's a very clinical question. I don't know if I can answer that properly, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they they uh, they adjust by by weight, uh, as far as I know, and uh, because of the clinical trials that they do this test of um, the first phase with testing different doses and so on. I think. They... I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a very clear question. I was asking that because the, the response in terms of signals may depend very much on the doses. Yes, ex yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very good point because in the cases that we studied and uh, when we we're checking the mutation rate. Actually, one of the patients have higher, uh, um, I mean, doses per day. So the, the platinum concentration per day was higher. And we saw that these patients have higher mutation mm -hmm. rate per day. So it, it, it could be, it could be exactly the dose, uh, the, the amount of dose of uh, platinum, it looks like, I mean, I'm just, Telling you to patients with lower and higher, yeah, yeah, and so I don't know if this is extrapolated to uh, in general, but that could be an explanation. The amount of of platinum. Uh, if I may, one more uh, general question. Yes. Do children that have had the, the child cancer have more chances of having another cancer later? Um, I don't know the statistics exactly, but in terms of second tumors. Even if it's rare, there's higher risk, uh, at least for sure, on the, on the, on the leukemias. The other, the they, they have higher risk of second tumors, second leukemias, um, and also like many other uh, yeah, like cardiovascular diseases. They have a lot of growth problems. Uh, yeah, sometimes, I mean, I mean, they, I mean, they're developing, they're growing, they are, they're, they're, their, their brains mm. are, you know, uh, being grown and so on. And so, Many of them they have problems on the development, on the, on the intellectual capacity, and the, and the growth of the body, and so on. So, yeah, and there, yeah, there's like a lot of, of, of secondary long term effects on the chemotherapy. One of them is the second tumor. Okay, so there are no more questions. Okay. Thank you very much.